Lal Rua lives in a tiny remote village in Mizoram. Her family sustains on a meager income of less than one dollar a day. Despite abject poverty, simple women like Lal Rua are spearheading a revolution that is sweeping the world of missions. Their movement, Bufai Thang, or a handful of rice. Bufai Thang is a practice where each Mizo family puts aside a handful of rice every time they cook a meal and later gather it and offer to the church. The church in turn sells the rice and generates income to support its work. Rice has been the staple food of the people of Mizoram. You are giving what is basic, essential, fundamental to your life. You are sharing that with God. With the passage of time, people have given more than rice, vegetables, firewood, cereals, and their regular tithes, empowering the church to be self-sufficient. Mizoram state is the most backward state in India, and we are the poorest of the, of the poor, but still, we can raise funds for the ministry of the Lord. At the close of this last physical year, we receive altogether around 13 million US dollars. Out of that, 12% of our total income is from the handful of rice collection. With 1,800 missionaries in India and many overseas, the Mizoram Church is known as a missionary church world over. This success is attributed to their selfless and creative giving. It is not our richness or our poverty that make us serve the Lord, but our willingness. So we Mizo people say, as long as we have something to eat every day, we have something to give to God every day. great to see the smile on their faces. Generosity brings joy. And generosity is a global thing, and we want to continue the conversation so that you can see that even those with relatively little resources can be rich toward God and further His kingdom. It's a, it's a blessing to see that. And we're going to talk a little further here with regards to other principles that uh, have governed some thoughts on generosity and even me moving a little bit more into the where question. We have three panelists with us that I want to introduce very quickly. Graham Power is a business leader from here in South Africa. Graham is the founder of the Global Day of Prayer. And Jonathan, I'm going to miss this, Onigbende who is a business leader from Nigeria, is going to share with us some of the principles that he has in his life. And finally, Henry Kastner from the U.S., who is uh, the founder of ministryspotlight.com. And Henry also, I want to let you know, is the one who produced the three videos that we just watched. And I think we should thank Henry. He did an incredible job. <laughs> Gentlemen, please share with us. Now, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful privilege to be here this afternoon. I started my highway construction and real estate business here in Cape Town um, 27 years ago in, 90, uh, in 1983. Since then, the Power Group has grown to its current position of one of the larger privately owned construction companies in the country. And through God's blessing and guidance, it has taken on a special focus as, as a kingdom company. When I made a commitment, which was only 12 years ago in 1999, to serve Christ 24-7, there were many things that I had to consider in my life. And I realized from the very start that Jesus wanted to be Lord of every part of my life, not just my spiritual or my church life, 
but also Monday till Friday. God has a will for my family, my business, and this would need to be discovered and obeyed. I started asking many, many questions. Some of them, what is the purpose of my work in this whole kingdom issue? Does God want to use my few skills I have and influence a network of relationships and wealth for a particular aim? Thank you. What does God want to do with a power group of companies? And how much personal wealth is enough? I read a number of books, um, and really the question was, you know, this 10% issue. I read um, the book uh, about Latorno, which said about how he eventually kept only 10% and gave away 90, and I had many, many questions. Through much soul searching and interaction, I came to make three very key decisions in my life. The one was that we would tithe of the profits out of the companies. Secondly, that we would channel this into a charitable trust or foundation, as the Americans would call it, um, and that we would allocate these funds towards significant projects with a key focus on Africa, um, but things that would transform the lives of people in tangible ways, such as HIV AIDS, food security, and then also a particular focus on prayer and upliftment of the poor through education, etc. One of the key things that I had to decide on that question about how much is God comfortable that I keep in my storehouse, and then decided to cap my wealth, to say, well, I think this is the amount that God is comfortable with. Now, I want to tell you at that point, my value was amount X, and it would take me like 17 years to get there. So I said, well, if I double it and I add a bit more, that will probably take me at least another 10 years. And once I'd set that cap, Three years later, it had reached that cap. And of course, now came the challenge. Would I stick with what I'd committed to do? And uh, then we formed a second charitable fund, so one from the company side, where we tithed out of our profits, and the second one, where on the personal side, any income that I got out of dividends or profits, etc., would go, and that would be capped, and everything 100% above that amount would be to give away for ministry and social transformation. We also, as a group, um, formed a very strict code of values and ethics. And that has been part of what has led to today what we call the Unashamedly Ethical Campaign on the website www.unashamedlyethical.com. There are a number of lessons that I learned about stewardship. The first is that God desires to have every part of our life submitted to His will and purpose, including our business lives and decisions, our wealth and influence. If we do that, God can use us in transforming structures and people. Secondly, through personal giving and the giving from the profits of the company, financial resources can make a significant difference to the lives of people and the aims of the kingdom of God when carefully and strategically administered and invested. One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10, which of course says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruits of all your crops, and your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. These two trusts have been intentional about allocating the majority of our available funds to larger projects that have a proven impact on society and have shown themselves to be transformative and sustainable. In other words, we get these thousands of requests do you give everybody $100 or $1,000, or do you rather try and focus on a number of key uh, areas where you feel you can make a difference? Simple principle is that we should seek to invest the money we are giving away in projects and ministries that are most likely to yield the greatest possible return for the kingdom of God. The end result is to seek to leverage the available funds for the greatest benefit to God, uh, to heal and restore individuals and society. And one of the things that I'm pleased to offer you today is that our trust has, um, would like to give you each one of the book on the Global Day of Prayer, which we have recently finalized. It gives the visions as God gave it, the whole story as it started here in Cape Town, rolled out from one stadium across South Africa, Africa, and this year on Pentecost Sunday, we had, I believe, over 400 million Christians, many of you, that have joined in this amazing day of prayer. So we would like to offer that to you. It's at the book, uh, t a table outside the book store, and you're able to get it immediately afterwards, any time through the rest of this day. We'll have the, ta uh, the tables there, and um, I will 
go straight there after this, and if you'd like us to jot a note in there. Just in closing to say that um, a second book has been done, which unfortunately not to give away, but it is there, Transform Your Work Life. It is in the bookstall, and um, I'm excited that God has got a special plan. He showed through these visions that there were three waves that would cross over Africa and the world. The first wave is a wave of prayer. Second is a wave of ethics, values, and clean living. And then what I believe will be the biggest transformation, revival that the globe has yet seen. The prayer has rolled out exactly as he showed. I'm believing for the other two. Thank you and bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. Ever since I was a little boy in northern Nigeria, I knew a lot about tithing. My dad made sure about that. He was a tither and a truly a gifted giver, if I ever knew one. Furthermore, daddy ensured that every one of his children knew God's heart about com the and commandment regarding tithing and giving. It is no surprise to me, therefore, that quite a number of years ago, when I asked my dear wife what she thought one of my gifts were, the first one she mentioned was giving. In my walk with the Lord, there are several scriptural lessons that I learned about giving. The first one is this, and this has been repeated over and over this afternoon, but I think it does bear re repetition. The first lesson is this, that God owns everything, as we see in Psalm 24, verse 1. Although many Christians vehemently argue that the balance after their tithing is theirs to spend and to keep as they wish, I believe the contrary is true. Because we own nothing. God owns everything. The second point is this, that I am simply a faithful steward of God's resources, which he has placed in my care, according to 1 Corinthians 4.2, and that I will give account someday of my stewardship to the Lord. The third lesson is this, and it relates to the story of the talents which we all know from Scripture. And this lesson has been a real guide to me. As the master expected wise investment of the talents that he gave to his servants, I need to be wise in my disposition, especially as I come into incomes beyond my immediate need. And finally, the fourth lesson is this. As the master promised great rewards for anyone who gives or lays up treasures in heaven, I have every motivation to learn about how to invest the master's resources. And so in my life's journey, these lessons have not only helped me to find my calling, they have also helped me to take action in resolving challenging issues that surround money, incomes, tithing, and giving to the church and missions. The following illustrates the point. Number one, tithing my personal income was not so difficult, but tithing business income took a considerable step of faith and obedience, especially when increasing amounts were involved. And I believe that uh, Graham has mentioned something along that line. But the lessons that I learned before, they taught me that obedience to the Holy Spirit and his guidance is paramount. And as our sister from Mali said before, God is no man's debtor, and it really pays to give to God. The second point, I believe, is this. Today, the key, in my view, is to find or see where the Lord is working and to go with that movement or to go in that direction. And it is interesting to see the way that the Holy Spirit ministers to us when we are willing to surrender to him 
to guide us in the way that we should invest God's resources. The Lord opened my eyes to the different organizations that are around. One by one, I became associated with what has become a network of evangelical missionary training and sending agencies in Nigeria and some other parts of the world. Thirdly, as I proceed in this pilgrimage, the knowledge that my giving to the Lord's work and to missions can actually expedite the Lord's return became an exciting prospect. And today, giving, I believe, has become to me almost like breathing. Uh, I enjoy it very much, giving to the Lord's work and giving to his people more and more. And today, by his grace, I have been able to teach these lessons to my children, to my family, to my church, and to God's people everywhere. I say to them, God owns everything. Listen, we must all at our very levels be generous givers, giving to God's work and giving to peoples everywhere. The results, my friends, are unbeatable. God bless you all. Most of us will agree that the most, most important question that a Christ follower might ask about giving is why give? Why give it all? And I think we don't need to look any further than the scripture for the reason why. And the answer, of course, is both explicit and implicit. Explicit in that there are more than a thousand passages in scripture that talk about stewardship and finances and giving. And you don't need to look any further than actually right in front of you on this table, a book that's called the Stewardship Bible. Ram will tell you more about that here soon. But of course, when you're thinking about why, there's a great explicit message. And then there, of course, is a great implicit message that we as Christ followers give out of gratitude for the incredible gift that's been given us, life. Now, I'm going to spend more time talking about the where give, but in understanding the primacy of why, uh, I think that you really understand the doctrine of grace, which is so important at the core of all of our faith. Um, when we talk about where give, I think that there's some principles that might assist us. Of course, number one would be, again, to look to scripture, and not just the passages on why, but almost with everyone on why, there's a story about where to give. And so while there are some great handbooks, and, and one of the books, for instance, that I love, that's really helped me in my giving, is called When Helping Hurts by Brian Fickert. And that's a great, uh, great message, a great book and resource. But that really goes hand in hand, really, with scripture first. But the third thing, and the one that I'm most skilled and qualified to talk about, are resources that you might find online. I believe that the internet, particularly the web 2.0, which is the interactive form of the internet, is the most important revolution in the school of distributing Christ resources and the word since the Gutenberg Bible. It makes the availability of resources for why and where and how available to everybody, where the widow and her might can get the same access to information and resources as the rich young ruler and his fortune. So I wanted to offer up an in incomplete list of websites that I think might guide us all in where we might be able to give wisely. One is something called ministryspotlight.org. At Ministry Spotlight, you can find ministries that match your passion at the same time that you can learn from ministry leaders through expert blogs and podcasts from different different groups like Christian Microfinance and Clean Water and Church Planning and Youth Discipleship. Another resource is called ministrywatch.org, a great resource that talks about the financial accountability of different ministries that you might consider investing in. There are a couple of new websites too that I want to call your attention to. One is something called globalfast.org. At globalfast.org, they provide a platform that allow for you to fast to give up a meal, something that we can all relate to. And with the proceeds, maybe $5 or $7, allocate micro-giving to different worthy causes. Another website that's really reached me is called worldwideopen.org. It's a website where Christ followers come together and share their relational giving and serving experiences. And then finally, the National Christian Foundation and stewardship in the UK, among other 
foundations focused on serving the Christ following giver are tremendous resources for being able to understand more about the questions of where, why, and how. I hope that you can help us to add to this list of resources. One of the subsites of ministryspotlight.org is givetogenerosity.org. There you'll find a great number of resources that Ram will tell you more about. But we understand that we know just a portion. And because I'm from the United States, I have a bias, a cultural bias towards things that are going on in the Western world. But we so desperately want to understand the resources that the Christ following world in all seven continents looks to. So please let us know the stories that you've seen and the resources that are an encouragement to you in your giving. Thank you. Gentlemen, thanks for your perspectives. Uh, global generosity, mobilizing resources so that the whole church can take the whole gospel to the whole world. Just look around and see how full this room is. Uh, this is a very important subject. Uh, how we interact with our financial resources is a litmus test of discipleship. It's a fundamental part of our lives as believers. And hopefully these sessions have been helpful to you. Uh,